Uh, Bonjour, uh, my name is Marcella and um, I'm Ojibwe or Anishinaabe. And I included a map here on this front slide of where the Ojibwe are located, um, considering that some of your audience is not necessarily familiar with, with it. So I found that uh, sometimes that can be helpful to people um, in terms of placing where indigenous lands are and our relationship to them as indigenous. So being Ojibwe, I am um, Ojibwe, I am enrolled in the Bad River Band of Lake Superior Chippewa Indians, which is in the state, the US state of Wisconsin. I'm also from other bands through uh, both my grandmother and my grandfather, like Fond du Lac, Grand Portage, and uh, more specifically and explicitly the Boundary Waters, which is the area between um, can what is now known as Canada and the United States. And that's in Northern Minnesota or what is known as Southern. Uh, so this is Gunflint Lake. And this is a place where my family is from and has been from for thousands of years and generations. And I really, you know, in terms of my practice as an artist and thinking about my feminism and as an indigenous or as a native woman, so my native feminism is really grounded here um, in this place and in these waters. So from the perspective we can see now is from the United States and then the, the hillside there's uh, Canada. Um, and that's really important and, or has been, has become more important to me as I work and grow my practice and my scholarship and my thinking about what native feminism is and what my practice is and understanding that duality of many things, uh, gender and sexualities and my relationship to the land and the duality of giving and taking, um, but also that duality of, of citizenship and place that was placed upon us, um, you know, several generations ago. So I think that, that what I'm trying to say here is that my practice is very much centered in place and, and that place is also what centers how I think about native feminism. Um, film and photography, and that includes super eight millimeter film that I've created, but also super eight millimeter film that um, that my father created um, from various generations, and then um, and found footage, and then um, and then those types of lens based medias from people that I'm working with, right? Um, so an example would be the film that's in this exhibit because of who I am. So we worked a lot with family photographs in that series of work. You know, I also use and tend to not exhibit um, paints, uh, process inks, um, gel printing. I do uh, sewing and fabrics. And um, I use a lot of large format printers and Xerox printers. So these large sort of office printers that are called multi-function Xerox machines, I believe, um, to do these sort of large printing um, images that are either just straight um, photographs that I've created or that I've manipulated or that are photographs that were seem to be visually manipulated already because of light inside the camera um, in terms of maybe my grandparents took those photos or something and then printing them on really large very cheap paper with this conceptual thinking of um, not being archivable. So, um, so maybe the framing is more expensive than the paper itself. Um, and that kind of lends to this part of my practice that's really centering the process over the product, right? you know? And so that, that goes to a lot of the, when I'm working in film and media, if I'm working with another person and their story, it becomes more about the process than the product. Um, and I think I've learned that that's um, common or a commonality um, within indigenous arts and aesthetics is the idea of the process over the and this idea of um, reciprocity and responsibility, which is really this not the same, but very much aligns with um, how I think about native feminism. So there's some aspects of the process um, in each of my pieces that remain the same, and then there's a lot that change. So this is a still, for example, where I'm working with um, digital photography and land-based images, but also working in archives to see the patterns 
that existed on, um, on our bandolier bags and recreating those patterns through um, digital tools and technology on the, on the part with the diamonds. Um, and if this was a video, this would all be moving in various um, directions intentionally. So, you know, that's the, the process then is, is layered to think about movement and direction um, with, with the technology being a tool of how to think about these sort of epistemologies and share or have a conversation with or about. Um, so my practice changed uh, dramatically when I became a mother or a parent, and and that's that's to say that you know my practice changed not in terms of how I was thinking about the world or what I was thinking about and how I thought about my relationship to place. I mean, naturally that changed a bit, but my practice changed in terms of time and how much time I had to actually do things and make things. So, so sitting all day in my studio, um, painting or sewing pieces of Bible paper together for a screen or whatever I was doing um, was something that I, I, I think I took advantage of. When I became a mother, you realize um, to make those things. So my practice had to adapt to that and not change the kind of art I was making, right? So. I was making art in, in small, quick ways, but also spending more time conceptualizing the pieces and actually um, making them. Um, and I think that's important to, I think that's important to sort of frame that question of what is my practice? Because there, there's the conceptual aspect of my practice and then there's the actual making of my practice. And so what do I have time to do? And then how can I adapt, right? My time um, and my place became one of the, the pieces of my practice as an artist. Um, and then again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to relate that back to as a thinking from this sort of um, femi native feminist uh, ideolo ideology is um, is being responsible to community and being responsible to our our nations and and our land um, and coming up with carving out that time to think how can I take what I'm doing for myself, which is a lot of the times in my art, and and share that with the, with community um, to to get to support their needs, right? So I worked for a bit and continue to work in um, tribal historic preservation. And tribal historic preservation is, is an important, uh, I would say department or part of our governing structures in, in many tribes. And this is um, sacred site protection, um, land, site surveying, things like that. So, so part of what I don't intend to do, but I, I think is helpful to me is I'm always, um, like how can I make myself feel more uncomfortable? <laughs> and working in tribal historic preservation as an experimental artist um, and scholar was definitely uh, making my, it was uncomfortable on a daily basis because I don't have a background in that sort of training. But um, what we did was things like this. And this is part of what I would call my, um, my community scholarship, right? That's interdisciplinary with, um, with the other things that I do. So you have these sort of anthropological records and archives that would say where something is that anthropologists maybe took in the 40s, right? And then you get these maps that are these really horribly made maps. And then how does the tribe or how does the community, you know, like what do we do with these maps? And then you get to the place and it looks like this. And, and this image is blurred intentionally. So, you know, but, and then it's taking that and then finding these, these pieces of rock art that you know, a lot of the living tribal members may not be able to get to, and then that knowledge will be lost. So how do we document it? Where do we find it? And is it important? You know, so these are questions that I grapple with, with community a lot and with our elders and, and youth and the, um, you know, cultural resources specialists and professionals. And so as an artist going out with these types of um, projects is really interesting to me. Um, 
and documenting it for them to make things with digital technology that might be more meaningful to the community than um, the actual, you know, sort of colonial idea of mapping and placemaking, but to restory those lands. Um, and you, if you want to relate that to Native feminism, you have like, people like Mashana Goldman, who's Seneca, I believe, right? Um, so you have people like Mashana Goldman who talks about restoring the land. Um, Luana Ross, you know, as early as the 1980s was talking about the importance of restoring the land. Um, where Mashana Goldman talks more specifically about mapping and the process of mapping as being a colonial structure, but also the power and in indigenous people sort of remapping. Um, so that was something that through technology and art, I, I, can, I consider um, community scholarship. It's very much outside of like experimental filmmaking that I'm usually working on. And then documenting uh, something like fire um, where when I come back and I'm presenting to tribal council, they're like, Marcel, we needed more of the scientific photos of, <laughs> of, of the fire and how, you know, how we can, how we can process this. And I'm thinking about the future and I'm thinking about the kids and, and I'm thinking about how, like the story that comes out of an image, um, or that could come out of the image in the future. And so when I go on these land surveys, they get things like this. And they get things like this, and it's it's like I can't help myself. It just happens, you know. It's like, well, I intended I intended to just take a picture of this rock and the lake that was affected by a fire, but then I start thinking about, um, you know, relationships to the land, and you know, and this like circular and all these things, and and then they get images like this where it's supposed to be more, you know. And then I go on these like conceptual thoughts and relating them to oral histories and, and teachings and it's like okay so maybe that's not helpful for them but maybe it will be I'm not quite sure but it is um, something that is a creates conversation right um, and then other other things that I that I do with technology and with art for the community um, to sort of stay accountable to community scholarship as what do we do with these archives and these archival images or maybe archival sketches from anthropology is like, are they interesting? Are kids going to look through the archives and know who people are? And so I should say here that this community here is not my Ojibwe community, but a community, an East Mountain community in Northern California, right? So they have these archival images or sketches from an anthropologist and so reanimating those and working with a, a member of their community to show them the skills to, to draw it and reanimate it and put it through these um, post-production processes and programs that I, that I know or happen to have learned. Um, and, then the, and then there's that knowledge of technology and then, the, you know, and then we drop them off at the um, tribal day school and the kids can color them and learn about who these people are. Um, so on one way, I realized that family photos are having family photos or snapshots is this um, is, is a site of privilege in a way, especially if when I'm thinking about my family being uh, Native American and having access to camera technology, you know, and, and depending on the generation, they had access to camera technology or I have photographs of them because anthropologists were going to take pictures of them. Um, and so those are stolen pictures or stolen images of my own family that I call them stolen because I'm taking them from some museum or archive, right? Um, and then it sort of changes over time to where we have our own cameras. So it's interesting to me, the, the snapshot is really interesting um, thing that I, I write about and um, conceptualize and, and think through, especially with native feminism and and our images and that i mean not all of these are snapshots here but but that that performance that performance of posing for a camera or like what made especially in a time where it wasn't digital and and you know you could just take a million pictures i always had to tell my kids that you know like you used to not be able to just take a thousand pictures they have a polaroid and it's like you you had to like really think about every shot you know so what made that moment worth that picture when you only had 14 pictures to take, you know? Um, and then, and then um, 
really centering in terms of a native feminist practice and art making is like really centering the stories of of um of my, my mother my grandmother or other people's um to, to consider that i could for me myself is like considering um, my grandmother in this instance as an archivist you know as a documentarian as an archivist that curated um a history of our family and how she curated it in photo albums, I think is a, is a lost art that I talk about a lot. And I, I try to speak to my students a lot about that, you know, like how are we archiving our histories now that the photo album is kind of this lost art. Um, and I just think there's, there's something there that's always um, continues to inspire me and in, in the work that I, that I do. And you see a lot of that in the piece because of who I am that's in this show. So another thing that I think, no, I don't think. Another thing that in, inspires my art practice and also my identifying with or using native feminism as a theoretical lens um, for maybe art analysis or art practice or writing is um, that I'm a child of the 80s or and 90s. And, and that's huge for me when I step back and think about it. You know, like um, Madonna was this huge influence on me. And so, yes, you know, Ojibwe, Anishinaabe, sensibility and theory. And I think a lot about the language and I use the language a lot um in my process and in unpacking things um even if how i'm going to start thinking about feminism like what words in my language work with that word feminism that english word so all that is existing but also um you know i live in a pop i lived in i live and continue to live in a world of pop culture and media um so i can't ignore the fact that someone like madonna made this huge impact on me um, and probably on my feminism and my identity um, before I started really thinking about indigeneity. So for this example of Ma Madonna in this shot, this is like going through my family, like a VHS of um, my aunt and uncle's wedding or some really important, you know, Christmas morning, some really, imp something important enough where my family thought to record it. And I'm watching through them to, to make a film um, called Blood Memory 2. And as I'm watching through them, it's like, and then in the middle, like Madonna's, you know, MTV music performance comes on. So it's like 10 year old Marcella obviously thought that Madonna's MTV performance was A, not to be missed. So I had to press record. And then B was way more important than the wedding or whatever family heirloom, visual family heirloom was on that tape. And I thought, is, does this happen a lot? And as I started watching through them, it happened all the time. Like you, so much Madonna, like every video she made. Um, and then, you know, other things, you know, um, but she and others like her in that era made a big impact on me. And um, I can see it, you know, in, in the way I started thinking about women, even, you know, in, when I'm 10 or 11 and Madonna's singing um, Borderline and doing these interviews on MTV. And it's, this changed the way I started to think about my own possibilities of sexuality and my own possibilities of like gender identifying um, of my body, of my physical body, of um, what a woman could be, you know, things like that. And then on this hot pink teepee is, again, you have like this moment uh, where I'm probably, I don't know, 12 or 13, and we're at a powwow. And I'm thinking, oh, this teepee would look way cooler if it was hot pink. So I think I was put in charge of like recording something important. And you can kind of see what was supposed to be important in the side. But my whole focus is on like changing the teepee to be hot pink using like, like the wrapping that came off the Coca-Cola bottle. And um, so I, I would just use those examples to say that I think I've always been experimenting. I think popular culture has made a big influence on me and my way I think about things, the way I think about my positionality and my position as a, as a, 
identifying as a woman and as an artist. And so because of who I am is part of a, a larger series of works that I am, that it can, I continue to work on and build upon. And it's uh, using family photographs as a, um, to center a dialogue on story, right? Um, story of, of people, story of native people or indigenous people and, um, and using those again, going back to that, my practice, it, using their family photographs as an archive and, and not so much in, because of who I am operated in a way as the other ones did in this series where we didn't go in with a story in mind. And I think that's important in terms of the process and how because of who I am became what, how it exists now. Um, we went in with just a stack of photo albums that I found really inspiring um, that uh, Jolene had access to of her family's um, snapshots, a lot of snapshots, and they were so cool. And so it was like, let's, you know, work with these and see what happens, <laughs> you know. Um, the, the, the idea, if I remember correctly, was um, focusing on Jolene as an artist and just as a person, you know, like, let's talk about these photographs, let's talk through them. And I had done that um, with, a, with a couple other people and I have done that with a couple other people since. And it's, it's all artists and all identifies as women um, or queer women or queer people, uh, indigenous. And it, the process is interesting because the story we think that we're going to tell has, has in all of these not been the story that is told. And that would be because of who I am. Um, again, if I remember correctly, we started the conversation talking about uh, Jolene's artwork and a mural that she was working on. And then really looking at um, the family photographs to narrate place, a home, and how, what she considered home and, and things like that. And then we came uh, across a picture that she shared uh, with me that was of her little self um, uh, dancing powwow in men's regalia. Um, and then, and then it, and then this whole other story just sort of happened. So we did the audio first, um, and then, and then the um, images second. And I will say, and I don't know if I've said this before, that the only reason it's in still photographs is I had actually used a video camera, but it was so overexposed, and I did a horrible job. Um, so it turned out really bad. And, and I, um, and I have that video still, and there's like a lot of laughing and mistakes happening. And then I, I did still photographs of, of it as well, simultaneously, just in case I fucked up on the video, which I did. Um, and anyway, so it just became easier, easier um, to work with. And then aesthetically, the still photographs made sense because of Jolene's inspiration, I would call it maybe, or background. Um, and passion for animation and drawing so that the form of animating through stop motion sort of lended to this aesthetic or this essence of her as a person and what we were trying to get at or what I was trying to get at with um, that, those feelings of, of that, right? So, so to say that there's multiple layers to people, it's not fixed. And so trying to get at those multiple layers. So for viewers to leave with something or have something to take away from watching because of who I am. For me as the artist or the creator of it, um, I think I would want it to be whatever they, whatever they feel like they got from it, if that makes sense. So every time I've screened it, it's usually, I'm usually there. Different people have different, um, sentimentalities or connections to it, whether that be about gender or culture or the family photographs or the sounds. And that to me is a beautiful thing. It's like, um, I would hope that people who have, who would watch or engage with, I'll say, because of who I am, are really not only looking, but really listening and not only to the narrative, but to the layers of sound and the layers of images and that it would lead to conversations that would unpack these um, settler colonial concepts of gender binaries 
or of culture as fixed or as land even as fixed. Um, and, and to begin to have that discussion and, and ask questions of what does that, what does that mean? What does that look like? And how does, how does violence, structural violence, not physical acts, but how does settler colonialism and these heteronormative constructs of gender binaries, male, female, men do this, women do that, um, upon bodies, upon lands, upon struggles and that um and th and then that those conversations are a part of this liberation of 